Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us today, given this very challenging time. I'd like to welcome you all to the second webinar in our ice rink series. We're thrilled to have Simcoe Refrigeration here presenting on ice rink heat recovery. So with us today are myself, Catherine, along with Wen from the Mayor's Megawatt Challenge, and we have David, Brad, and Jay from Simcoe Refrigeration, and Jim from the city of Stratford. So welcome, everybody. So, and also Benoit just joined in from Simcoe as well. Oh, and Benoit from Simcoe as well. Sorry about that. Okay, so just a little bit of background for any of you who don't know who we are. So we run a program called the Mayor's Megawatt Challenge, and we've been working with municipalities since 2003 to improve the energy use in their own facilities. So our core program is really the sharing of best practices and case studies using a data-driven approach. So our mandate is to help our members reduce greenhouse gas emissions and advance energy efficiency in their own municipal facilities. And we're now working with a network of leading industry experts across Canada to support our member initiatives. We're really excited about that. So with the impending climate crisis, municipalities across the country are declaring climate emergencies. And they're not just empty um, emergencies. So associated with these are declarations, um, the declarations and associated greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And some are very aggressive. Um, they range from 50% reduction by 2050 to net zero emissions across all municipal, municipal buildings by 2030, which is a very aggressive target. So we realized through the program, there is an urgent need to collectively figure out practical ways to reach these very ambitious goals. I think that's the key, um, collective and practical. Um, so we figured ice, ice rinks are a great place to start. Uh, 20 to 30% of a municipality's building portfolio energy usage and greenhouse gas emissions are in arenas. So they're a really great area of opportunity and a priority building type for the municipalities. Um, large municipalities have many, many ice rinks, and even the smallest municipalities have at least one. Um, ice rinks are the hub of the communities and a really great place to showcase net zero efforts. Um, also, there's 5,000 municipal ice rinks across Canada, so there's a really great opportunity to scale up and engage municipalities across the country down this net zero path. So working as a cohort of municipalities and leading industry experts, we're working to develop a roadmap to net zero emissions for existing ice rinks. And I'll now turn it over to Wen to give you some of the details on this roadmap. Hi, so the roadmap will follow a systematic process to identify the four areas of an integrated solution. First is the energy efficiency to improve operations and equipment efficiency, and then heat recovery to use as much uh, of the waste heat as possible back into the building. We, rec we recognize that energy efficiency and heat recovery go hand in hand and are the two major components to reduce the demand of the building to as low as possible. Then we can integrate renewables to cover the remaining demand and leave the purchased carbon credits and other offsets as the last resort. In developing this roadmap, we're transforming the industry to get, to get all the existing buildings to net zero emissions. And we start with using ice rinks to map out the foundational approach that can be then scaled to all 8,000 ice rinks across Canada and then to be developed to use for other facility types. We're in the final rounds of recruiting strategic partners and also participants for the Ice Rink Initiative. If you're interested in being part of the Net Zero Roadmap for Ice Rinks across Canada, please contact, contact Catherine Wilson, the Program Manager. And without further ado, let's welcome David, the Head of Marketing at Simco Refrigeration, who has been working with us to advance the emission reduction in ice rinks. So I give you over the control, David. Okay, great. So thanks, Wen, and, and um, I, I'd like, before I get started, I'd like to thank the Climate uh, Challenge Network and the Mayor's Megawatt Challenge for inviting us to present to them today. Um, you know, the, the Climate Change Network is, a, is a nonprofit organization that is uh, focused and has a mission to reduce greenhouse gases um, and uh, reduce energy um, across, uh, across Canada. And we're very pleased to be a part of that. And, you know, awareness is half the battle when it comes to uh, what we can do. And, and arenas uh, present a really uh, great opportunity for us to, 
um, a great opportunity to, for us to recover the heat um, in these buildings. So today we've got a pretty exciting um, presentation for you. We're going to start with arena refrigeration, the basics. Uh, we're going to dive into some heat recovery, and then we're going to go down two ice paths, uh, the, uh, net, the net zero uh, now and net zero over time retrofit opportunities. So before we get started, a little bit about Simcoe. Simcoe was established back in 1913. And when Simcoe started, the biggest competition we had was actually ice from Lake Ontario. Uh, since then, we've expanded to about 1,000 employees and 29 offices. Uh, and one of the uh, fun fact is that uh, Simcoe has uh, been involved with over 50% of the world uh, wreck ice surfaces. So chances are, if you're somewhere in the world and you're in uh, an, ice, uh, an ice plant, uh, it's going to be a Simcoe system there. Uh, and lastly, our, our, we're really committed to sustainability. Since Simcoe started back in 1913, we've always used natural refrigerants such as ammonia and CO2 as part of our base designs. As an organization, we are fully integrated. We start with our engineering and design department. Uh, we then manufacture our own uh, ice plants. We install them and then we service them. And I think what's really important here is this continuous feedback and loop um, to share information, to make sure that we're continually evolving and taking advantage of the latest uh, technologies. From an experience perspective, we get involved with lots of community ice rinks. Um, we do some very interesting skating paths, some interesting designs. We are involved with some uh, Olympic events like bobsled runs and ski jumps. Uh, we get involved with some special projects like the outdoor game for the NHL Winter Classic and uh, this interesting project for Canada 150 in front of the Parliament buildings. And we also are involved with large venue arenas as well too. But all, although these uh, are all different and have different requirements, they have something in common. They use a lot of energy. And uh, they use so much energy, in fact, that it's up to 12% of the natural gas and 17% of electricity. And to put this in perspective, if you take a look at the chart on the right, housing is 20% of an average municipality. So this is a real opportunity because one of the byproducts of refrigeration is heat. And heat is, natural gas is used for heating arenas. So by utilizing the waste heat from the refrigeration system, we can uh, really, um, there can be a big part to part of the climate uh, initiatives that everybody uh, has right now. If we just take a look at refrigeration from a very simplistic view, uh, there's a lot of things that go into creating that perfect sheet of ice. And a lot of ice makers will tell you that it's really minus five Celsius. That's the sort of sweet spot from a refrigeration point of view. Um, so to get that minus five, what we need to do is we need to circulate a brine or glycol solution through the floor. So as you can see that red uh, pump is pumping glycol and it's pumping it out at minus eight or 17 degrees Fahrenheit. And so when you think about refrigeration systems, like when I first started, one of the things that was really um, sort of, I had to get my head around is your refrigeration systems aren't really making things cold. They're really removing heat and they're taking it from one place that you don't want it to another place. And as you can see here through the journey, the Brainer glycol is leaving at 17 degrees Fahrenheit it goes through the floor, it picks up a couple of degrees and moves back into what we call a chiller. From the chiller, there's an, a secondary loop of ammonia or CO2 that is circulated throughout the refrigeration system. There's a compressor, uh, goes to the condenser and then loops back to the uh, plate and frame heat exchanger where it takes the heat from the brine or glycol. To power that, we use electricity, okay? So I don't know if everybody remembers their grade 10 science class, but uh, as old Albert Einstein said, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. And the electricity is changed into heat and become, goes through the system. So one of the key facts here, as I said earlier, is the refrigeration system is really moving heat throughout the system. And as you can see, the, the, in the most basic terms, that for every unit of electricity that we put into the refrigeration system, it, rem it moves three units of heat from the, uh, from the arena floor. So if you take that into perspective of your home furnace, I think that a lot of people would be excited with 98% efficiency. And that basically means for every unit of energy that you put into your home furnace, there's 2% waste and you have 98% efficiency. If you put that into the same terms of a refrigeration system, 
you're looking at 400% efficient in the sense that it's four to one. And that's where the really exciting opportunity exists. For somebody that's new to refrigeration, it's very difficult to get your head around. I'm making something cold, yet I'm getting heat from it. But really what we're doing is we're just moving that heat from one place to another. So as Albert Einstein also said, in the midst of difficulty lies opportunity. And with this uh, climate goals that we have in place, there is really this opportunity to capture that waste heat and use it as part of your, uh, within your facility to offset that natural gas use. So here we go, instead of putting it outside, we're gonna take it back and we could use it for all these things within the building um, that you would normally use natural gas for. There's a study done uh, a few years ago um, that looked at a rink before and after uh, a heat recovery plant was installed. As you can see in the left-hand figure, the average ice rink seasonal uses about 2 million kilowatts per year. 42% of the use is in heating. Once after the uh, heat, the eco chill plant was put in, a heat recovery plant was put in, uh, you might notice that the refrigeration portion of the pie went from 23 to 42%, but as you'll see down at the bottom, it, the total kilowatt usage was cut in half. That's really where the big opportunity here is for everybody here on the phone that has a climate emergency, is reducing your um, use of greenhouse gas by using the waste heat within a refrigeration system. So to do that, we basically have two ice baths to net zero. Um, first, we're going to take, we're going to meet with Jay Zito. Jay is a project sales, uh, the project sales rep within Simcoe, and he's designed over 200 arenas over the course of his 10 years at Simcoe. He's pretty much seen every single rink that you can imagine from retrofits to new builds. And he's going to be taking you through how to utilize waste heat in a new build situation. Over to my right here, we have Brad Wilkins, and he's been involved with over $4.5 million of incentives that he's been able to get through um, business cases and by working with uh, organizations like Save on Energy. He's got 16 years of experience and has probably been to every ice rink in Ontario or, or pretty close to it. Um, and he's gonna be going through net zero over time. And that's gonna be really where most of you are, is how do you, with your existing building, you know, what can you do now to really uh, jump into that concept of net zero over time? So Jay, um, take it away. Thank you, Dave. So is there, can everyone see my screen okay? Presentation mode? Okay, perfect, thank you. One second. So thanks, Dave. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Jay and I work for Simcoe Refrigeration as a recreation contract sales for Ontario. As Dave had mentioned, my area of expertise is in ice rink designs. I work with many consultants, architects, and municipalities to help them design, budget, implement capital projects. Um, and during design, I, I assist by educating and offering the latest types of equipment in the market, many of which involves heat recovery and ice plants. So we're here to talk about opportunities for net zero over time. My focus is to share with you two major capital projects that meet those criteria. The first project is the BMO Center. This facility is located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It is owned by the municipality, but operated by Neustadia. This is a greenfield project that was, that cost about $40 million to construct. Uh, this 160,000 square feet of space has four ice pads, four beach volleyballs, a multi-purpose room, along with the retail, uh, sports retail store. But before we get into the refrigeration system, I want to share with you an article written by Ammonia21. There are several points that stood out to me. Uh, one of those points is the Federation of the Community Municipalities, which consists of municipal leaders from across Canada. They have what is called FCM Awards of Excellence, which recognizes and celebrate the excellence of municipal leadership. And they have a range of awards categories, and the BMO Center was actually awarded for the most efficient design. This facility exceeds the Canada's National Energy Code by 40%, which supports this fact, the fact that uh, Halifax Regional Municipality has stated that they save over $100,000 annually. So what type of system 
do they have that can implement this type of achievement um, and, and savings? Well, they, they've put in place an EcoChill system. It's capable of storing waste heat and delivering it back into the building. And that's, and that's critical. They can provide 5,414 MBH of waste heat. And that, for some of you, that equates to about 90 to 120 homes of heating. Provides 100, 90 to 120 homes for heat. Now, as Dave has shown in his previous slide, traditional systems would like to take that energy and reject it outside. It's just to reiterate that four kilowatts going outside. And what did the BMO Center do? So they've implemented the EcoChill. And if you look at this diagram, you can see how they have done that. They use that waste energy that they've already paid for back into their building. So how does it work? Well, they, they have the system that can re recover the waste heat in what is called a thermal storage tank. Think of it like a rechargeable battery. It, it stores energy and provides energy on demand. This thermal storage tank does the exact same thing. But let's assume the dressing rooms in your facility is dropping in temperature and requires heating. Well, the integrated control system with the VFD pump can circulate that waste heat throughout the dressing rooms and bring that temperature up. However, if everything's connected to this, whoever, however, if everything's connected to the system and calling for heat, it can provide that demand from this thermal storage tank. So you can see that it goes to their underfloor heating, radiant bleachers, domestic hot water, dressing rooms, and snowmelt pit. So, so let's go and see. So the next major capital project I wanted to share with you is Dufferin Arena. It's located in the city of Stratford. Uh, for those of you got a lot of viewers here, uh, this is located in Canada in the province of Ontario. What's unique uh, about this project is that it used to be an outdoor rink, uh, but got converted into an indoor rink in 1969. It wasn't until recently that this facility got a major retrofit and they've implemented, which it's, this retrofit had a price tag of about $4 million and includes an additional 10,000 square feet of space and it has a heat recovery system from the ice plant, low maintenance green roof and some lighting upgrades. Now, just like the BMO Center, they've implemented an eco chill system that can store and provide waste heat back into the building. Dufferin Arena uses waste heat for their boiler preheat, underfloor heating, snow melting, and radiant floor heating for their dressing rooms. This diagram illustrates the radiant floor heating throughout the, their dressing rooms at Dufferin Arena. The red lines indicate hot fluid circulating throughout the dressing rooms, and the blue line indicates the cold fluid returning back to the ice plant. Oops. Sorry about that. So we actually have a little surprise. We've got, we've invited Jim uh, Bryson from the city of Stratford to come speak about his project uh, and how he got started, challenges he faced and how he currently, how, and how the facility currently operates. So Jim, thanks for taking the time to speak with our audience. Uh, do you mind introducing yourself, including your past work experience and your current position? Certainly, uh, my name's Jim Bryson, of course. Uh, I manager of facility city of Stratford. Uh, Originally was an operator at uh, Thornhill Community Center. I was chief over at uh, Markham Centennial. I followed construction. So when we re rebuilt uh, Centennial, we did that. Then when I moved to uh, City of Ajax, where we, when we added two pads to the existing two to turn it into a four pad, I came up into this Southern Ontario in uh, 2004 to build the pyramid uh, center in St. Mary's. Got it. So what, what prompted the city of Stratford to take on this type of project? Why, why not leave it the way it is? The existing facility, uh, when I first came to Stratford in 2009, was horribly inefficient, uh, had a lot of life safety issues in it as well, lack of sprinklers, those sorts of things. Zero, there was no zero grade entry, even though it was a single pad. So it needed a lot of upgrades to bring it to modern uh, standards, but it was a real energy I would, I would call. So I imagine um, funding, uh, we had to get funding. 
so how did you how did you get funding from council to proceed with such a large project? I mean, four million dollars is is not a is a it's not a, it's a big feat. Well, I presented not just the cost of the project, but I presented the cost of not doing the project, as well as the cost of the project over seventy five years, not just one year. I mean, which is a mistake I've seen other uh, individuals in my line of work do in the past. So I was, I was careful to make sure they understood what the cost would be year by year over 70 years. Right. Now, did you face any challenges along the way throughout this process? Certainly. Uh, when I first presented, uh, obviously there was a little bit of pushback. Uh, the cost was an issue. Uh, but uh, I managed to find a grant program. Uh, at the time, there was a federal grant uh, program called the RINC program, so I managed to get half the build cost covered through that because of the energy efficiency in the project. So actually, the entire retrofit on the building cost $2 million to the city. And then the other remaining $2 million came from, from some funding? From the federal government, yes. Right. Uh, how did you end up selecting your contractor? Uh, well, I... We did a design bid uh, build pro process, which I've done in other municipalities as well. Reason why I did that, so we're paying the uh, architect to design the building, but, but also then they're working in conjunction with mechanical contractors like Semco to design what we desire, not right. necessarily what would happen in a design uh, build situation. Right. Now, I think this question here is going to intrigue a lot of our audience here. How much are you saving today? Well, uh, right now from before, it's a uh, difference is about $53,000 per year on that rink and just in electrical energy. I have a comparable rink, a uh, single pad, same square footage, costs approximately 125 to 130,000 in uh, electrical energy each year. This rink, I can tell you uh, year after year, it's 65 to 68,000. Yeah, those electric. are huge savings Yeah, for, 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 for a single pad. Um, yeah. Massive. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, do you have any advice for our audience here looking to implement what you've done here at Duffer and Lines uh, Arena? I would do the same things. Uh, I would uh, I would definitely add, if it's a greenfield build, I would definitely try to add geothermal to it. Uh, so that would get you closer to zero, absolutely. Uh, I'd stick with the uh, polymer glass uh, so you have no issue uh, in daylight. It also makes the ice rink a lot more uh, presentable, uh, a lot nicer for figure skating especially. Um, definitely, the, like I said, the green field, uh, definitely go geothermal. I mean, it's the one opportunity to, to work in conjunction with the refrigeration plant to get to zero. Right. And I believe Dave Fowler actually has some questions for you as well. Uh, it, yeah, I did actually a few for you, uh, Jim. Um, I'm just curious, what is Stratford's uh, target for the uh, the climate? Or well, actually, is Stratford in a climate emergency? And and what is the target? We are, we are in a climate emergency. We are working uh, right now. We're still working on the final numbers. We're looking to get to zero by 2035. Uh, obviously, uh, that's a, a very aggressive target, and it may be affected by what we're dealing with in the background today with COVID-19. However, uh, I think it, it's an achievable target, but it really comes down to retrofitting a lot of buildings. Right, and, and um, how, you know, I know that in the past there's been, you know, climate targets in place, but do you find it's being taken more seriously now than in, you know, other times in your career? I would tell you for certain, I think uh, not, not only uh, the general public is far more interested in it, and not just by a cost-cutting uh, uh, standard, definitely as far as environmental concerns. I mean, the world that we live in, and we're all very aware of the fact that suddenly it's much, much nicer outside because there's a lot less industry happening. So if we get into a world where there's a lot of industry still happening without all the pollution, I think we'd all be a lot happier. Perfect. Well, Jim, thank you uh, for, for your time and sharing your journey to, to, to net zero. And feel free to stay on to, uh, for the remaining of the presentation. But I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, coming to talk to us here. Thank you very much. So the last item I want to talk to you about is the importance of integration. I, I personally believe the key to successful integrated system is one, having a refrigeration system that captures the waste heat. The second item is to have a control system that can direct that free heat and control, control both the mechanical 
and the refrigeration system. The third, thirdly, the, having a mechanical system merged in with the refrigeration system for seam seamless operation is also vital. So having these three components is, is critical to an integrated system so that everyone's communicating with each other. Now, unfortunately, we are on limited time today, and I wish I could dive further into the importance of integration. And, uh, however, you have, if you have time, please visit our website, uh, and, and you can access the must-haves for the perfect net zero ice arena. This can be found under the news tab blog, um, and I appreciate for listening. Uh, I'm going to send this over to Brad Wilkins, where he will dive into retrofitting existing, existing systems. Um, and we'll be channeling out the questions in the end, so be sure to stay tuned. Well, in the last 10 to 15 minutes will be for questions and answers live. So everybody can see my screen okay? Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's staying safe out there. My name is uh, Brad Wilkins. I've been with Simcoe now for over 16 years. My current role as team lead is to help customers and account managers develop plans for the future and improve efficiency and recover the waste heat in the building. Uh, the key to getting started to a net zero over time is to identify the equipment upgrades in your building. Uh, this is done by reviewing existing equipment, completing life cycle reports, review path to net zero, provide replacement options, and finally develop Sorry, business. Brian, I think your screen sharing was off. Okay. Sorry, guys. Yes. Is it good now? Perfect. Okay. Sorry, guys. So, yeah, and the last thing I wanted to mention was provide a business case to ensure that you get the funding to do the upgraded project, which, which Simcoe can help you with. So here's the, the pathway to net zero. Um, what I liked about this was illustrating um, that the, there's a lot of opportunity by understanding where your base emissions are and the potential energy efficient equipment and heat reclaimed potential is in your building. As you can see, once you realize your base emissions and start down the path by incorporating energy efficient upgrades and heat recovery solutions, you can get down to 70% towards your goal. I cannot wait till we start having stage three and four conversations. I know we can get there together and there's lots of opportunity. So before we get started with the options, let's discuss the potential. As you can see in the graph here, there's, a, there's way more heat available than what is required. There's a huge opportunity to recover the waste heat and lower your greenhouse gas emissions by upgrading or adding equipment. If you take a look at the previous diagram, there's a lot of opportunity to use that heat generated by the system that you're already paying for and to capture that and reuse it in the building and save on the operational costs. Here's the net zero roadmap. By having a roadmap, it'll ensure your plan is executed. As you can see, it's a journey. Be patient. You can't get there right away and it takes a lot of time. The decisions you made today will impact your path to net zero tomorrow. The typical life expectancy of uh, the refrigeration equipment is around 25 years. So when planning, make sure you challenge all the options available and make sure you select for the future. So here's the goal, here's the end game, to recover all the waste heat from the refrigeration system to lower your greenhouse gas emissions at your facility. The first step is reviewing all your options that work best for you and your rank. As stated earlier, by recovering all that waste heat and absorbing it, and because you're already paying for it anyway with the refrigeration system, you can lower that from 42% of the operational cost down to 11. That's a 30% reduction. So I've reviewed with a lot of the account managers across Simcoe, new and retrofit projects completed by Simcoe over the last four years. And here are the results. 95% of the projects um, of, of the retrofit projects uh, were retrofit upgrades. They were not new build. And the main reason is the cost to replace with new is just a substantial amount, as Jim alluded to before. 70% um, of these upgrades were like for like replacing with the exact same technology. So I'd like to take a, 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 from a personal perspective here and picture your family vehicle when you were a kid. So mine growing up, we had a family that traveled a lot. Ours was a blue GM Astro van. 
It was convenient, it was practical, but it lacked efficiency, safety, and reliability. So when my parents went to uh, get a new vehicle, they did not go for a like-for-like -like model. We selected a new technology that was safer, that was more reliable, that was a lot better on gas. This goes the same for refrigeration equipment. You need to think of the future. So when you're out there and you're replacing your equipment, aging assets, look at all of the options available for replacement. Don't just go like for like, that's an easy solution. Challenge yourself. There's a lot of new, like make sure you select the latest technology. I cannot stress this enough. Your path to net zero starts with selecting the latest technology. Give yourself the best opportunity to tap into that waste heat um, that you're currently paying for now. So we completed a poll of 100 of the uh, retrofit projects and we just wanted to get an understanding of why they went like for like. So I'm just gonna have a little fun here and play some Family Feud. So we asked 100 end users, why did you replace like for like? The number one answer was awareness. Supervisors were not aware, contractors were not aware of the new technology or may not be comfortable with the new technology, so they avoid it. Uh, consultants are not aware of it. They might use um, cut and paste information from a previous specification for that job. It's really important to be aware of everything that's out there. Purchasing departments, ensure the bidding, the fair bidding process. I'm sure you've all heard that before. Sometimes the right solution has only one supplier. Stick with the original objective um, and, and stick with the solution that's right for you. Alignment. Internal decision makers are not aligned with the solution. Uh, purchasing directors, managers, make sure you guys are all, all aligned with the solution that's right for you. Wrong budgets. Budget submitted was not, not enough for the right solution. It's too late. The RFP has already been sent out. You can't change it. The budgets have already been passed. I can't change the budget. Make sure that you're, when you're doing your budgeting and uh, getting the information, you do it and give yourself enough time. Not comfortable. Change is difficult. In our industry, the technology has made some advancements, but a lot of the older technology is still reused today. So make sure you look at all the options and, and uh, be comfortable with, uh, with the solution that's right for you. Um, as you can see, there's many reasons why like for like occurs. The key is to ensure you have a plan and you know all the available options before choosing a replacement. Okay, let's recap, recap the potential and review some options. So back to Dave, uh, Dave's um, slide here, a lot of the energy or a lot of the natural gas in the municipality is used, is made up from the arena. So let's focus on the natural gas saving opportunities at the arenas. So um, as you can see here earlier, uh, typical arena refrigeration systems do not, that do not have heat recovery end up wasting all of that free heat and sending it out and dumping it out the condenser, uh, which is located at the back of the building. So all of that free heat that you're already paying for is leaving the building. So where do you recover the heat? So what, you, what your goal is, you wanna take that free heat from the refrigeration system and send it over to the HVAC um, or water boiler system and preheat that water. So where can it be used in the system? There's a lot of options. Replacing equipment with newer technology, adding upgrades to recover the waste heat, and making sure you're tying that all into the existing HVAC equipment so you absorb, you absorb that waste heat within the building. Here's a typical design. I just wanna take a look at replacing one component as an example. So let's take the evaporative condenser. Here are your condenser options. You can go like for like, or you can install a smart contain within the refrigeration room. The like for like option, again, you're limited with options. It doesn't provide any channel for you to recover that waste heat. Whereas the smart contain would be installed within the refrigeration room, giving you access to tie into that heat to preheat the building. One of the uh, ways to do that is through a heat pump by sending all that free heat to different locations in the building and offsetting the natural gas that's required to run those HVAC units. The key here is to ensure that your controls are set up properly to recover the waste heat. So let's, let's just take a little bit look at the incremental cost difference between the two, like for like versus smart contain. 
the smart contain will be a 50% more uh, investment on the upfront cost. Well, let's take a look at the numbers. The like for like, the budget for that, let's say is $100,000. The smart contains $150,000. But by tapping into the potential and recovering the waste heat, you're now gonna um, uh, be able to save almost 93,000 cubic meters of gas per year. Now this is based on a single pad arena running 100 horsepower at 3,000 run hours per, per year. But by installing the smart contain, now you're opening up the avenue to be able to recover that waste heat. The estimated utility savings based on the numbers at 25 cents a cubic meter is $23,000 a year. And the life cycle savings over the course of 20 years, you're looking at $460,000, a, a substantial amount of money. Now, another thing you can, uh, the other avenue you can choose is adding equipment to the existing system if your assets are in good condition. You can do that, you can preheat your water for free. So there's three options to, to uh, install in your room. One is the Alpha Laval Smart Heat. The second one is a Dusset D Superheater. And then the third option is a free heater. Keep in mind, all these can be installed during the season. Um, you may experience some minimal downtime, but you can schedule that throughout the year and you can receive um, some incentive, fund, incentive funding to offset the upfront cost. So again, here's a typical design. Your tie-in point would be on the discharge line heading out to the condenser. You would install your equipment and recover that waste heat and preheat the water coming into the building. So let's look at the numbers of the set and the free heater. So the budget to install a set is around $50,000 and the budget for a free heater is around 25. The annual estimated savings for installing a set is eight to 10,000 in, uh, in gas savings a year and the free heater is three to five. Another uh, option to consider uh, is installing a dehumidification and recovering the waste heat to improve the efficiency of the dehumidifier. Um, this summer, uh, there's a new Smart Dry 2.0 that's going to be hitting the market. The nice thing about this dehumidifier, it's going to be able to recover some of the waste heat to improve the performance of this dehumidifier. So here's a typical layout uh, for most seasonal rinks. You'd have two mechanical dehumidifiers adjacent from one another. These dehumidifiers worked 25, 30 years ago when the season was from October to March. But now that the seasons have extended and the buildings are running eight to nine months a year, you need to increase your dehumidifi dehumidification capabilities. And, in, um, and by doing that, what you can do is you can replace those mechanicals with Smart Dry 2.0 dehumidifiers, but also tie into your refrigeration system and recover some of that waste heat. And this will improve the performance of those dehumidifiers. So how do you determine when to replace? This is a question that comes up a lot. So what we recommend is first thing is complete an on-site on inspection from a service mechanic. After you do that, review the maintenance records of all the equipment. Here's a, here's a list of all the equipment that's in a typical room. Um, and make sure that the maintenance is being done based on manufacturer specifications. And then the final thing you wanna do is compare the ages of all the equipment with the industry guideline, which is ASHRAE. So ASHRAE has set out the um, life expectancy for all, all aging HVAC and mechanical equipment and make sure you compare it and to find out how much life is left with your system. And that'll help with your planning. So let's take a look at some net zero over time projects. The first one I wanna look at is Covent Garden Market. And the second one is Lambton, Kent and Dresden. So Covent Garden Market is located uh, downtown across from Bud Gardens, it's an outdoor skating path. And the city's goal to net zero is to get to net zero by 2050. So the first thing that they did was complete an asset report on the existing assets and decided that the majority of the system um, could use some work. So they decided to replace a lot of the components in the system and reusing some of the components. So by doing this, so this is a before and after look. So they had an R22 100 horsepower system uh, had no uh, heat recovery capabilities and 700 pounds of R22. So due to the aging assets and the phase out of R22, they replaced all of the equipment. They repurposed their condenser as a cooling tower. They left the controls in place, but now they can tap into that waste heat 
And the other key thing to note here is they were able to lower their charge 90%, going from 700 pounds down to 65 pounds of ammonia. And the efficiencies are still the same, if not better. So I want to look at what their net zero solution is. So they, their room is located in a parking garage. So they're now able to tap into that free heat and use that to heat their parking garage. If they were to recover all of their waste heat right now, they would save 70,000 cubic meters of gas, which equates to $18,000 in savings in operating costs and lowering their greenhouse gas emissions by 80 metric tons. Lambton, uh, Lambton Cantarini in Dresden, uh, their goal was to reduce 20% by 2035. Uh, they reviewed their assets and they were in the middle of, uh, of their life, so they didn't need to replace anything. So their decision was, let's add equipment to this, to this room and recover the heat. So here's a before and after look. As you can see, no waste heat recovery. And then they're adding a juice at D superheater to recover the waste heat. So where this room was located, it was right beside the Zamboni um, room. So they were able to preheat their Zamboni water and they were saving approximately eight to $10,000. So when you look at the potential from the system, there's still some room to recover some more waste heat to offset and to lower their um, greenhouse gas emissions. So just a reminder is once you do a project, find out what your potential is and then work on all the plans that are gonna achieve that. So again, make sure you investigate all your options when replacing equipment. The newer smart equipment that's available on the market today will allow you to lower your operating costs. It's gonna provide real-time information and it's gonna allow you to tap in and recover that waste heat and use it in the building. I wanna challenge everybody on the call today. So when you are doing your business cases, make sure you get all the information and find the best solution that's right for you. Our contribution to the Smart uh, Association is our Smart Hub controller um, that controls the refrigeration system. The controller has the capabilities to be operated through an app on your phone, and it can operate multiple rinks, um, control changes. You can get real-time power consumption, which is key because your plant can be operated inefficiently and you know right away. Um, alarm notifications, but all of this stuff is in real time, so you're gonna get notified right away, so you can make a decision on what you need to do. So the path to net zero steps are to consider are these. Complete, number one, complete an asset report. Make sure you know the condition and the age. Challenge all the solutions for replacement. Find the one that's right for you. Collaborate internally with everybody, making sure that um, the solution ends up being the one that you install. Obtain the accurate budget pricing for what you wanna do. And make sure you build a business case to, to get the funding necessary to do the right job. And the last thing is stick to the solution. Ensure you get what you want. You put in a lot of energy and work to provide these plans. Make sure at the end of the day, it is what it is, what is installed. So I just like to recap here. There's lots of options to recover the waste heat from the system. You can replace equipment with newer technology. You can add upgrades to recover the waste heat. You can tie into the existing building HVAC equipment. I encourage you to to reach out to the experts and develop a plan that works for you, for your path to net zero. If you're looking for help, please reach out to Simco. We have account managers all across Canada and the US that are ready to help you guys with your plans. I'm gonna pass it over here to Dave just for some closing remarks. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Jay. So, I mean, as you can see, I mean, this topic really, quite honestly, could have been a three or four hour presentation and we've crammed it into a 45 minute awareness presentation. So there's a lot of things that we could have gone uh, over and we could have gone over in a lot more detail as well too, a lot deeper. And I can see that from the, uh, <clears throat> from the questions that we're getting. Um, so because this was crammed into a shorter period, I would encourage everybody <clears throat> that uh, would like more information to, to reach out and contact us. We've got lots of ways through social media. Uh, you can follow us. We're always um, posting new ideas and projects uh, and, what, and things that are interesting things that we're doing. So I encourage everyone to follow Simcoe. And um, I would like to thank everybody uh, for, for joining today. I think it's been a great presentation. I look forward to, uh, to connecting with you. So thanks very much. 
Okay, and um, we have uh, a few minutes for questions. So I'll start taking up questions that came in chronological order um, on the designs um, and then technical feasibilities first. So the first question is, for a condenser replacement project, what can be incorporated in our existing refrigeration system for additional energy reduction? We already have a VFD on the condenser fan and also a fan for switch uh, over our Simcoe 600E. What else can be implemented in our system and also rough costs? Rod, do you want to take that one? Um, I thought Ben was okay. So just to recap when they have a VFD and a 6L is need currently right now. Yeah. yeah. What kind of heat recovery they can get from an evaporative condenser with a VFD? Any other energy savings uh, options available? Well, they can upgrade their, their compressors with more efficient compressors. I'm not sure the late, it's hard to answer that question without doing a full study on their equipment um, and ask a, a study and condition assessment. Um, there's, there's a more efficient reciprocating compressors on the market right now uh, that they could look at. But again, until, I, until you have a look at their system, it's very challenging to, to provide that, an opinion on that. Yeah, like I would assume that the, because the VFD and the 6000E that they would already have floating head pressure. So it's, yeah, yeah, that's pretty, pretty much what you can do at that point with a evaporative condenser. We also have a lot of questions on heat recovery and where the heat can go. So first question is, can you do the heat recovery project and expand it in the future? For example, if we were to implement a heat recovery project in the arena, can this be expanded to the pool in the same facility? And I think we answered that in the, in the presentation as well. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll speak to it very quickly. I mean, let's just say if Dr. Arena decides to add a pool uh, to his facility, um, we could take that heat and throw it into the pool. If that pool has change rooms that also needs heating, we can extend that radiant floor heating into dressing rooms. And maybe I didn't effectively put it across, but anywhere that a building requires heat, we can certainly provide throughout uh, the building. So where you, have, where you need heat, we can provide it. And then just to add to what Jay was saying, I mean, that's what really speaks to me about the net zero over time approach. Um, because we can put in something like a smart contain and we could set everything up. Like, let's say, for example, you need to replace your condenser. We could set it up so that in the future, as you start to replace your aging HVAC equipment, we can then tap in to the refrigeration system. So that's why I think that whole snake diagram that Brad showed is is really an interesting way to take a look at the holistic view of your facility and where you want to head, where it makes a smart contained project really make a lot of sense. And two more extension questions on that is, um, there's some pools, uh, sorry, some rinks that operate throughout the summer, but also not attached to the pool. So where are the other options for waste heat? And second question is, have any waste uh, heat recovery projects been done to heat pools? Are there case studies? Yeah, so we, we've done lots of projects with pools. I don't have the exact numbers uh, right now, but I'm sure we can provide them. Yeah, if during the summer um, there is no demand other than a pool, uh, as been mentioned in the chat, it, it can go into dressing rooms still. Um, you, the, the heat demand might be lower in the summer because you don't need heating, but the system can provide it if you do need heating for snow melting, underfloor heating, uh, dressing rooms. Again, anywhere we need heat, especially preheat for domestic hot water um, is, a, is a good option. Um, at bleacher heating, if you have bleacher seating for comfort, that's one of the biggest challenges a lot of these facilities face between comfort cooling and maintaining good ice quality. And Jay, the new dehumidifier, the Smart Dry 2.0, can incorporate the waste heat to to uh, use it for dehumidification. Exactly. So there's really it's just really up to the creativity and uh, uh, of what you wherever you use the heat, to, and we can we can use it. There's an abundance of it, and that's what makes it so interesting. Uh, there's a question of, um, on the design of it, um, on the efficiency. Um, it says, um, it's well known that evaporative condensers offer higher efficiency for a refrigeration system. Your proposal is a PHE, it has a lower efficiency, it requires cooling tower and pumps, and more maintenance. So can you el elaborate on the design a little bit more? Yeah, just so our audience understands when um, this question rephrases PHE, it means it's a plate and frame heat exchanger. Uh, versus an evaporative cooling or evaporative condenser. So they're comparing between the evaporative condenser and the, and the method that we use to reject the heat. Um, there's different methods and there's reasons why. Uh, I don't want to dive into it now because this could be a 15 minute conversation, um, but it has to do with uh, heat recovery. At the end of the day, it has to do with uh, generating that heat recovery 
which is why we don't use any evaporative in, in, in the scenarios I was showing um, for an eco chill. And is there a CO2 version of eco chill? Can that be retrofitted into your rink? Absolutely, yep. Okay. yep. And then uh, the extension is how do you deal with the low critical pressure? So we, we have, and that's where I'm saying having an integrated control system is critical because it's a fine balance between mechanical system for heat recovery versus the refrigeration system that calls for cooling for an ice pad and rejecting that heat. So it is a very critical portion to have a control system that understands the refrigeration and HVAC system to balance those things out so that you have a seamless operation for heat recovery, energy efficiency, what you reject outside, what you don't. And, and yeah. And um, this is also a question for, for you and both also for, for Jim. Um, what are the technical challenges and also implementation challenges and as well limitations and solutions for using waste heat in retrofit situations, particularly like heating of bleachers and dressing rooms? Uh, and what's the economics, economics like in those situations? You want me to handle it? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I would just say myself in, in a a uh, small uh, single pad arena ourselves we don't put heat into it uh, obviously every btu of heat you're you're putting into the arena has to go through the ice so we don't put it into back into the arena itself um, obviously there's lots of need for in uh winter time or uh, you know three seasons so to add heat in the summertime yeah you could if you're going to run a single pad with an eco chill you're going to need another place to dump some heat into uh, we, we have a, a cistern that we collect rainwater off the roof in, easy place to dump the heat for the core. Yeah, some arenas may dump the heat back into the arena for ventilation. And especially in the winter when, when it's cold, you, want, you don't want to bring that cold air into the facility for comfort. So that's where our heating system can preheat with a coil and bring a preheated uh, air temperature coming in through the vent ventilation system. And as David mentioned about the dehumidifier. It uses it requires heat to remove that moisture and again coming from the refrigeration system you're using less heat um, because you're using it from the refrigeration system something that you've already paid for mm -hmm. and the next one is um could this work with a partial geothermal system absolutely we've done plenty of them we actually was going to do a case study but due to time we have a great case study that we've done for the yukon um, where they have implemented a heat pump and if, correct me if I'm wrong Dave, they did have a geothermal I believe. That one had geothermal yeah and then Upper Canada College as well has a geothermal so there's uh, there's lots of uh, op lots of people have done that as well too. Yeah and we're looking at right now at a facility where they've asked us to come and do an energy study to look at their geothermal loop and see how they can tie it into the refrigeration system so it is absolutely possible. And we have a lot of questions relating to um, quantifying the amount of heat. So can you flip back to a slide to um, where the quantification of the heat is? And so the question is, um, how much heat can be recovered from, say, a 100 horsepower compressor? And how much of that could be used back into the building? So I may not go to the slide just again, with, with timing. We want to get some questions in. But the, the concept here is that the heat that we pull from the system cannot be 100% recovered. That's the intent. You never want that unit outside to be turned on. You want to recover 100% of that heat. So just for simplicity, it's, let's say you have 100 tons, you can capture, you, the intent is to capture 100 tons back into that building. Mm -hmm. And another question on how the smart dry dehumidifier system work. Is it natural gas or is it electric? It's, a, it's electric. And um, it's it, it it can tie into the refrigeration system so that you can offset the required heat from the using electricity and offset it using the refrigeration system um and it and it needs to be installed the nice thing with those ones it can be installed on the existing platforms that the mechanical dehumidifiers are on right now to save on the install cost and there's another question on the economics um, of this. So in the previous um, case study, the, the cost was four million and then there was two million incentives plus 50,000 annual savings. So the payback doesn't look as attractive. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the four million cost? Yeah, and I, and I should have maybe made it more clear. The, the four million was an overall project and I'm gonna let Jim maybe talk about the facility because it wasn't, four million was not just the refrigeration heat recovery component. There was a lot of other things in there that I believe uh, would not would would make that payback look weird for sure. Yes, 
the four million actually represents the entire building. Uh, all that was left from the existing building uh, when we uh, gutted it was the superstructure for the arena. All other spaces are new, all walls, floors, everything. So the refrigeration system, I don't remember the exact price, but I think we're talking about 900. Yeah, so, so the payback would be dramatically different. <laughs> yeah, but it's, yeah, four times as good as that. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I think that's the time we have question, for questions. I'll hand this over to Catherine, and then she'll give um, a bit of the final closing and also logistics of sending the information to all the attendees afterwards. So let me just share my screen. Okay, Catherine, you're still muted. There we go. Okay, well, I would just like to say a huge thank you to the Simcoe team, David, Brad, Jay, um, and Benoit, and to Jim from the city of Stratford. Um, this was an amazing presentation, really, really interesting. Um, you can see from the huge number of questions that um, this is a really, really interesting topic. And um, the municipalities can really see some benefit of this and how it's going to help them to reach their uh, gas reduction targets. So, Again, this was a fabulous presentation. Um, so as Wen mentioned at the beginning, this presentation was recorded. So we will be sending out a link to the recording through um, the mailing list, as, as well as a takeaway document with some key features of the presentation, along with some of the questions and answers, since there was such um, an overwhelming amount of questions. We'd like to document that as well in the takeaway document. We'll be sending those out to all attendees within the next week or so. Um, and here's my contact information again. I'm Catherine Wilson. Please feel free to reach out um, to Simcoe if you have any specific questions about um, the presentation or if you have more general questions for me about the program um, or if you'd like to participate in our net zero ice rink roadmap study, please don't hesitate, hesitate to reach out to me. Um, thank you again everyone for your time in joining us today and to all our presenters. Um, take care everyone and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.